Hi, everyone. Welcome in. I hope that you enjoyed the last session. Um, we'll just get started in a few seconds as people are trickling in. Great. Well, my name is Ambreen Ali. I am one of the author of the case studies that um, we published today through the CUNY J School um, on the creator economy. And today's session is going to be about collaboration, which is a subject of one, one of them. Um, I'm going to introduce our wonderful panelists in just a few minutes. But before we do, um, I wanted to take a quick poll just to get a sense of what kinds of collaborations folks have already tried. So let's do that. There are two questions. The first is about the kinds of collaborations that you've tried. And then the second is about the biggest challenge that you've faced so far. Feel free to answer these if you're not um, a creator yet, you know, just in the context of your workplace and the collaboration you've done there. You can see the results are trickling in. And if you just joined us, we're just taking a quick poll of the room before we get started to find out the kinds of collaborations folks have done already. Okay, we'll close the polls in five, three, two, one. All right, so. Um, what kinds of collaborations have you tried in the past? It sounds like co-creating a product is the most popular and um, a third of the people have not collaborated in the past. So um, I, hopefully this discussion is useful to you. Running an event seems like the second most popular. Um, working together on ways to generate revenue came in kind of lower on the list. And then some folks said that they've done other things. So please share that in the chat, the kinds of ways that you've collaborated. Um, and then the biggest challenge in collaborating with others, uh, the biggest one is arriving at a shared vision and goals. That's definitely a big one. And we're going to talk about that. And then the time involved in ensuring both sides deliver, relinquishing control comes in last. Well, that's good. All right. Thank you for sharing those insights. And um, let's get started with our conversation. So just a reminder that you can put questions into the Q&A. We're going to have a chance to ask those questions of our panelists after we do a little bit of a chat and that we're recording this session. If you, um, you know, want to re reference it later, we'll be sharing it with everybody. So we're lucky today to have three very excellent creators with us from very different parts of the creator economy to give us their perspectives on collaborations. Uh, we have Amanda McLaughlin, who's the creator and CEO of Multitude, which is an independent podcast collective and consultancy. They're really taking collaboration to the extreme level, so she can tell us a little bit about that. We've got Jay Klaus, who's the writer of Creator Science and the host of Creative Elements, which is a narrative interview podcast uh, exploring how top creators make a living with their art and creativity. So not only is a creator himself, but he's sort of an expert on how creators do what they do. And then we've got Andrew Huang, who's the co-founder and CEO of The Yappy, a political news site focused on the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Um, an all volunteer group of four people who are punching way above their weight. So he'll tell us a little bit about how they pull that off. Um, let's just start by having each of you talk about how collaboration has played a role in the work that you do. Amanda, do you want to start? Absolutely. Collaboration is totally central to the work Multitude does. We are a podcast collective, meaning that we are a place for podcasters to own their own shows and also share resources and get support in podcasting very like traditional radio models, because that's the sort of predecessor of our genre um, and our medium. We have a lot of um, sort of examples of a network that will sign a show and take, you know, their IP or take a big share of their revenue. And we really want to stand as an example of how you can do it while being ethical um, and having people bring their expertise, their audiences, all under a shared kind of vision and tone and actually flourish because of it. We don't believe that bigger is better. We believe that having small, sustainable businesses in the creator economy is actually the future of how this industry will go. Um, and it's just a pleasure to be here. I can't wait to talk more about collaboration, ups and downs, the pros and cons, and how to make the best of the situation. Awesome. Thank you. I'm seeing in the chat that people are drooling over your audio and Jay's video. So you... <laughs> that's well, listen, Jay. I 
$80 Logitech webcam. So uh, I don't know what the ROI is of your setup, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> much more expensive than that. Jay, um, we'll go to you next. <laughs> so, hey guys, I'm Jay. Um, creation plays a role in a lot of ways for my business because uh, there's lots of different levels. Um, similar to Amanda, uh, my podcast is on a podcast network, um, the HubSpot podcast network. We just actually announced that yesterday. Um, so that's a new move, but I've been on podcast networks since the beginning of the show. And it's been huge for me because it helps me to get the show in front of new listeners who are already listening to other related shows. Uh, it gives me a pool of interviewees to pull in because other podcast hosts make great guests for my show. Um, and it's also a revenue share agreement with uh, that network where they're doing a lot of work on my behalf, finding sponsors, pulling in uh, opportunities for marketing campaigns and it's it's a win-win for both parties involved. And really in, in this world that I'm living in as an independent creator, collaboration is how most things get done in terms of getting in front of new audiences and getting your message out there. Uh, so there, there are just ways big and small that I collaborate with people that I'm happy to dive into deeper, but it's it's very much like a concentric circle type of thing where there's all kinds of levers. Great, and Andrew? Yeah, um, I'll echo a lot of what has already been said by Amanda and Jay, um, but as a publication, so I think um, we're the only one here who is really focused on the editorial aspect. Um, number one, collaboration is a part of it because it entails us trying to magnify our coverage, trying to work with um, other publications as well, and trying to not only advance what we write, but also advance issues across the board. Now, not necessarily advocating for one view or another because we are a nonpartisan and nonprofit organization, but we are here with a clear mission, which is to try to advance the Asian American political cause in terms of bringing better uh, awareness to um, whatever we do. So we've pursued um, editorial collaborations. Um, we've done grant collaborations with other, uh, other groups, uh, including podcasts and other things of other media. Um, and we also are trying to figure out ways to tie in sponsors and donations and also uh, making sure that those sponsorships uh, and work in ways that the Yappy, it does align with the Yappy's mission. Um, and as we are a relatively young organization, I think we also view every collaboration as a learning opportunity. And it's an opportunity for us to learn from people who have come before us, especially in the space. Um, and it's, you know, it's incredibly exciting when you're able to find that overlapping mission, overlapping ideals, um, and it can be incredibly productive uh, and augments our overall output. And so would be uh, would love to eventually later go on more specifically into what I mean across those areas, but yeah. Yeah, I and mean, we could do that right now. So the word collaboration, I think, is just so encompassing of so many different types of partnerships. It can be something so small, like let's work together on this one project, and then it can be something quite permanent, like in Amanda's case um, at Multitude. Um, and the sometimes I think people are intimidated because they feel like it's going to be so much work to oversee a collaboration. But the idea for creators is to really just sort of um, you know, kind of offload some of the work. You're wearing multiple hats. You're juggling many roles. So how can collaboration work in ways that, uh, you know, really help you as a creator and help you do more um, with the limited resources that you have? Andrew, do you want to take that first? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the first one that comes to the top of my head is the collaboration we did on a grant from the Solutions Journalism Network. It, we did this in collaboration with two other uh, podcasts or media organizations. One was self-evident uh, media and another one was called AZI Media, both focused on Asian American causes. So there was that initial overlap and we had overlapping missions. Um, but next to that is that, you know, we were, this is the first grant opportunity that we actually really pursued. And so I was mentioning that this was a learning opportunity. And the good thing about this is that Yes, like you mentioned, we wear a lot of hats. You know, in the meantime, we were trying to produce a newsletter and produce editorial content, but it was a way for us to get into the financial space of fundraising. And it was also an opportunity to see, you know, how do people more experienced than us actually help us? You know, how, you know, how do they go about getting this revenue? And so uh, as a first foray, it was really incredibly exciting because we had people, you know, we were not only able to learn about um, applying for these grants um, and also gain that knowledge from, you know, uh, expertise, people guiding us through the process. We had self-evident media, AZI media coming through and 
um, giving us guidance in terms of meeting and checking in, establishing accountability. We signed an MOU as to how revenue and uh, would be shared among us, all of us and how we would remain accountable to checkpoints throughout the six months that we did this grant. And then lastly, I would say, that um, we were also able to collaborate in terms of building off of each other's media coverage. So we amplified each other's coverage on uh, each website. Um, we learned how to cross promote. And so I would say that as a first opportunity, it was a great opportunity for us to learn. Uh, we divested a little bit of the, I guess the responsibility of having to check in and trying to be on top of everything because we had people who knew, knew it better than us. Uh, and we were open to the opportunity and to learn. I think that's kind of, um, the main thing and why I'm incredibly grateful to those two organizations for taking us on and guiding us through the process, I think. That's great. Thanks for the specifics of that. Jay? Well, I think most important for me as a solo creator, especially in the beginning, like you just don't have a lot of resources to go very far. Um, and then everything's on your plate, right? So it's kind of like what you're saying, Ingrid. So for me, I've always looked for partners that I could align incentives really closely with so that, you know, whatever effort I'm putting in and whatever effort they're putting in, the outcome is, you know, evenly distributed or distributed in a commensurate way with the effort. So like the podcast network, that's a revenue share agreement. I have a similar agreement with my, my newsletter where somebody else is selling the ads, but they get a commission based on how much they sell of those ads. But even with other creators, um, the currency that a lot of us are working with is uh, attention to be kind of blunt. So, you know, that is something that we can compensate each other for um, if we're trying to help each other out. Like if, if somebody is trying to get their podcast in front of a new audience uh, and that host is trying to do the same, I don't have to necessarily pay that host in cash. We can do a uh, a partnership where I interview that host, they interview me. Now I'm in front of their audience, they're in front of mine. That is compensating us in a way that is not cash, but is accomplishing the goals that we're trying to do, which is spread our message and get in front of new people that this would be a good fit for. So that's that's kind of how I look at things. It's, it's, it's this 2R lens. Is this going to help me with reach? Is this going to help me with revenue? And however that comes about, is that also aligned incentives with the other people that are involved in the in the transaction. Amanda. Yeah, I uh, co-host Dungeons and Dragons podcast. That's one of the first podcasts we had in our collective. It is a thriving and growing community online of people who watch other people play role-playing games or listen to it in our case. And when you're putting together a Dungeons and Dragons campaign, it's important that the people who are the characters you're playing need someone who can heal, someone who can fight, someone who can take damage and like get in front of the rest of the party and like be a human shield in a, you know, in a situation, someone who can use magic. You don't need four people who can all use magic because then if somebody comes and like, you know, stabs you with a knife, you're all like, oh my God, no, I'm so soft. Ah, help me. Uh, you don't need four healers because then no one can cause damage to foes that you meet along the way. And a collaboration is the exact same way. The, the, great privilege you get as a creator is that this is not a job that there are a lot of templates for. Uh, it can be very lonely, it can be very scary, but that also means that we get to set our own standards and examples of how we want this to go. And so I don't know about you, but my kind of uh, ideal situation in the world is that I get to do the thing I'm really good at and not spend time doing things that I don't know how to do or I feel uncomfortable uh, with or I hate. And so whenever we start a collaboration, some of those questions that we ask each other include, what do I love doing? What do I hate doing? What do I not mind taking from somebody else? And what do I definitely not want to put on my plate? And that allows everybody to really run in their lane and do the thing that they are really good at. Um, thank you, David and others for uh, for liking that analogy. Uh, my husband, Eric Silver, who runs the uh, Join, Join the Party podcast, talks often about building a balanced party of collaboration. And there are some articles on the Multitude website all about that. But that's how we really begin and say, you know, I love spreadsheets, you love Instagram. That's a great combination where I cannot touch our social media, you cannot touch our spreadsheets. Um, and just being upfront and talking about that is a good way to start a collaboration. That's great, really good practical advice. Um, now, I think every collaboration kind of comes with some inherent risk because you're passing over a little bit of the control over the thing that you've built. So what do you need to know about the person or the organization you're collaborating with before you agree to work with them? Uh, Jay, do you wanna start this time? Yeah, most important to me is I want to understand their expectations and what makes this a win for them. Because typically, if 
if things don't go well or if uh, things don't seem as amicable or everyone's not as happy as they were, it's usually because there's a misalignment of expectations and the result. And that usually comes from just like not having a very clear, honest discussion up front of what those expectations are. You need to know what the target is that you're that you're shooting for. So important to me, and I do this even when I interview someone on my podcast, before we start recording, the first thing I ask is, what would make this especially awesome for you? Is there anything that you really want to talk about? Is there anything you really don't want to talk about? Just so I know, what does success look like in their expectations? And if they say something that is not what I expected, like, oh, we think that this can result in X amount of revenue. And I'm thinking, oh, that's not even the goal that I thought we were trying to do here. I thought this was something else. Then we need to you know, reassess and talk about, well, what are we trying to do here? Is this clear? Is this actually going to be a win-win for both parties? And to me, it's just being really crystal clear on expectations up front. Andrew, do you want to talk about, uh, I know you've mentioned the importance of mission alignment for you guys and editorial alignment. So, um, you know, what do you kind of try to find out about the organization or person before you decide if it's a fit? Yeah, and I, um, I would definitely echo everything that Jay just mentioned, obviously. Um, but it goes along with having an aligned, um, just, you know, not only aligned editorial coverage, but also aligned missions. Um, I think editorial coverage is more clear for us as a publication. The YAPI is nonpartisan. It is not, uh, it is also not an advocacy organization. We're not trying to, because we are also currently applying for uh, nonprofit 501c3 status. You know, that's actually, uh, it's an incredibly important thing for us as an organization to remain that way. And we, we have had multiple opportunities um, to collaborate in the space where uh, with potentially advocacy organizations or to reprint uh, opinion articles. Uh, currently, the YAPI has a no op-ed policy, and it's there for good reason, mainly because it doesn't align with our mission. Our mission is to provide news, to provide the information people need to make their opinions on the issues themselves. And I would also say that when I, we began the YAPI itself uh, a few years ago, we were excited by a lot of opportunities in the Asian American space, especially you know as they are a rising demographic. We could have chosen from doing foreign policy, which is very relevant, and I myself enjoy foreign policy very much. But unfortunately, you know, to have a clear idea of what you want to bring to the table and to bring to your audience, um, you have to set those standards and be willing to enforce them uh, when it comes to collaborations as well in terms of the editorial sphere. And I would, uh, to go off of a little bit of what Jay talked about before, I think the second thing uh, beyond this kind of strict adherence to editorial or, or just coverage or just overall mission is, um, like he said, you know, go when you go into a collaboration, I think a lot of times there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of enthusiasm for a collaboration. I myself am very enthusiastic about it, the people we want to work with. But sometimes you can't, over time, you realize you can't really articulate exactly what specifically this collaboration would look like. And I, I would say that for some advocacy organizations that we've tried to work with, we realized at the end of the day that it would provide a conflict of interest if we were covering the people who we are uh, also, you know, we are partnering with people who are also covering at the same time. And we've tried to figure out ways to make it work, but it, even though it matches in a general aspect in terms of, you know, our uh, interests in advocating a major American cause, at the end of the day, it doesn't come to anything concrete. So I would say, and maybe that's a symptom of what this, you know, what not to do, I guess, in a collaboration. But um, I think that's also something I also look out for, along with the other things I've mentioned. That's so useful. Thank you for sharing that. Amanda? Yeah, I think it's so important to have a shared vision um, and a shared goal. And like I was saying a few moments ago, whenever we begin a collaboration or we are talking to a new host to potentially join the collective or even a client um, to take on for paid production work, uh, we want to make sure that our vision align and asking them questions like, why do you want to do this? What does success look like for you? What would make this not fun for you anymore? And, you know, what is a good outcome? All these questions are so important to get, you know, out of the way straight away, even saying things like, you know, if we were to make money, which might not be a goal for everybody, but might be a goal for some, um, you know, what do we want to invest that money into? Is it a priority that you make some money from your time here? Or are your goals in other in other forms, things like establishing a portfolio piece for yourself, you know, building up a professional opportunity, meeting others in your field, making an impact on the community. It's so important to have goals that are, um, that are real and tangible. They don't have to be measurable, in my opinion. They don't have to be like business school smart goals 
to count. Your goal can be something like, you know, make an impact on somebody. And what that would be, you know, the form it would take is an email from somebody saying, this made me feel less alone. This made me feel really excited. This, you know, made me feel uh, inspired to try something new. And so all of that is really crucial to get on the same page about. Your goals don't have to be the same, but they do have to be clear to you. Um, And again, talking in advance about if this becomes not fun for one of us anymore, if we, you know, don't hit a certain goal, um, if we, you know, get six months down the line and make sure, you know, and see that this is not what we expected, it should be really clear from the start. And there should be things in contracts on paper about what, you know, what should happen if somebody um, decides that they don't want to do it anymore, or if we mutually decide to stop Um, and getting all of that out of the way early, like good, you know, premarital counseling or something, it makes the rest of it feel very smooth because you've said the scary thing of what happens if I want to quit? What happens if I don't like this? All of that is so crucial, as is kind of reassessing those goals as time goes on. Um, It's so important to have regular meetings and check-ins with your collaborators, whether it's, you know, regular monthly meeting or for our executive team here at Multitude, we meet twice a year to, in July and November, or June and November, to catch up against our annual goals and say, you know, what did we want to do at the start of the year? How is it going so far? And what can we adjust? So it's not like you are harboring this sort of secret resentment or, uh, you know, secret worry that something isn't going exactly as planned. There is a time on the calendar where you can say to somebody, hey, I know I committed to doing this, but I'm not loving it. Um, Or, hey, this thing that's on my plate, I am so enjoying and want to do more of that. Give me more. The way that you envision your collaboration going at the beginning will almost never match how it actually goes. Sometimes it's much better. Sometimes it's much worse. Sometimes it's just different than you expected. And so going in saying and expecting that responsibilities and roles may shift over time is in my mind, the key to an ongoing collaboration. Some of our shows are seven, eight years old, and that is not an accident. It's because we have adjusted our duties and our goals and the workflows with the different sort of ways that our lives change over that time. That's great. And I think that you have the approval of a lawyer in the chat saying that this is all very spot on advice. So I think we're on the right track. Um, uh, I want to mention, Amanda, one good piece of advice you mentioned in a previous conversation we had, which is to Google the name of the person or organization you're um, you know, going to be collaborating with. Google them with canceled. And what was the other one? Yeah, uh, cancel scandal and uh, controversy is how I vet all podcast sponsors. I manage the ad sales for a multitude as well as a number of uh, independent creators. And hey, you might not be surprised by the number of meal boxes that have food safety scandals or union busting scandals uh, or the number of tech companies that just explicitly want to put people out of work uh, and focus on AI or you know have shipping um, shipping issues. Better help, Joe. There's no problems with better help. That was one TikTok that people uh, read and uh, took out of context. So doing your own research, I know it's a, a buzzword and a thing these days, um, but it's it's important. Listen, I, I want to um, just really home in on something um, that has been mentioned a few times here. The trust of your audience is what gives you value as a creator. Having an audience that listens to you, trusts you, and you can kind of rent out their time to a sponsor, that's, that's what sponsorship is. Uh, that's what it's been from the very beginning. Um, And so being able to know that the stuff you're putting in front of your audience has, you know, that you can stand behind it, it's an endorsement of some kind, whether that's an ad that you run, a person you have on the show, or a podcast you recommend. And it is important to treat that trust like the fragile gift that it is. Trust is is hard to regain once it's been lost. And so thinking about, you know, can I in good confidence as much as a person possibly can know that the thing I'm recommending to my audience is a thing they'll actually enjoy is a long-term strategic business decision that is really important. That's great. Um, Jay and Andrew, do you want to jump in here? We're sort of moved on to the next question, which is like, what sort of upfront conversations do you need to have to make sure the collaboration doesn't fail? Is there anything you want to add to what um, Amanda just shared? Yeah, I can go first. I mean, for us in the journalism sphere, um, reputation is everything. Um, And perhaps we, you know, we recognize this even (laughs) more acutely, uh, considering that credibility in terms of what we put out to our readers is uh, is you know top of mind everything you know in terms of every single thing we do um and when i guess you know going off of the search terms that amanda's put out there i'd say that we have we personally have previously looked at not only uh, what our sponsor our sponsors have done in the past but also even what our sponsors have also who who 
what other kinds of organizations our sponsors have partnered with in the past as well. So it's not just about, you know, kind of that reputation passing on from the sponsor. It's also, you know, a few degrees of separation there. <laughs> but it always comes back to you. And so that's kind of the issues that we have there. Um, conflict of interest for us, uh, as I mentioned before, is clearly uh, important. And also, I think uh, important conversations that we also do need to have is includes, you know, just figuring out how to split the work or figuring out how is this even going to be feasible, really. And I think this goes back to really articulating the specifics and not just being idealistic and saying we like a partnership, but saying, you know, this is how we're going to be able to implement it in a specific way. You know, you're going to go do the accounting or you're going to do, you know, the content creation or the media promotion of, you know, this aspect. And this is how we're going to break up the work. I think it's really quite important uh, in terms of that as well. Yeah, I agree with that. I have I have not a lot to add on what Andrew and Amanda have said here because I think it's spot on. Um, I, I do, you know, as your platform grows and you have more people looking at your work, you will have a lot more people looking at you as a potential collaborator, collaborator and partner. And a lot of those people don't have your interests at heart at all. <laughs> so like you have to hone your sense of uh, feeling that pretty early on. And even as you go through the process of planning this, like, is this really an us thing or is this a you thing? And I'm like a pawn in it. Um, and it gets easier to spot that pretty quickly because people who have that attitude are often not super self-aware or empathetic. So it, it's it's easy to sense it, but it is something that I would call out because for a long time, as you're, you know, you're, you're trying to build your way as a creator, you're saying like, yes to everything. You're like, yes, 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 yes. And then you get to a point where you actually need to say no to almost everything. Um, or, you know, the, the, the trust is lost and people uh, don't know what you stand for. And uh, you're suddenly chasing all these partnerships that aren't serving you or the people that you serve. So I, I would just uh, call that out as something to watch for. Yeah, yeah. every collaboration should be an equal exchange of value. And whether that is, you know, people getting to put their name on something together, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's the chance to, you know, do something and be rewarded um, later, you know, it it is important to have that equal exchange, even and especially if you're at a part point of your career where you can't pay in money. Uh, we pay all of our podcast guests, but in the first couple of years when we were still working on getting our feet under us and earning an audience, we made sure to, you know, give them as much kind of access to our audience and, you know, help and support in exchange for their, you know, 45 minutes or hour of of helping us create value by making a podcast episode as we possibly could. Um, so it's, it's definitely crucial to think both when you are reading pitches and when you're sending them, how can I give value to this person? How can I make sure that both of us walk away having gotten something out of this? And I'll add one more thing, if that's okay. Um, and I know we've previously discussed this, but um, for uh, me, this has always been a team decision about who we do collaborate or do not collaborate with. Um, you know, there are certainly people on my team who know the journalism sphere or conflicts of interest and editorial coverage better than I do. And so it's always in my best interest to listen to my editor in chief when she tells me this is clearly not the right way to go. Or perhaps, you know, there's a sponsorship that's maybe not with the right people. You know, there are people who keep me on my toes and there are times when, you know, we build that trust in between our team and we are willing to listen to each other is a critical part of it. And being transparent with our team when we decide to not pursue an opportunity or to, to actually pursue an opportunity. And um, and I think, man, we've you know, previously talked about this, but it's also being transparent with our you know readers when we do make those decisions as well, or, or our subscribers, our audience. Thank you all. That's such great advice. Um, I'm going to move the conversation towards kind of how do you find collaborators? You know, you, they may be coming to you in your inbox, but if you're just starting out, maybe you're the one kind of thinking about who should, I should partner with. And before we do that, um, let's just take a quick poll to find out where people have um, looked for collaborators and found them in the past. So, um, you know, let's get the answer to this question. And then just a reminder too, to just pop your questions into the Q&A. We're going to move into the Q&A in about five minutes. Most of my collaborators come from something that's not listed. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> and that may be the case for other folks as well. So please feel free to use the chat. Okay. Let's Thank you, show the results. 
And it looks like personal contacts is really kind of the, the majority of the way that people find people to partner with, um, followed by networking groups, you know, your Slack and Discord channels, um, engaging with your audience. And then um, seems like I'm kind of surprised, like only 3%, which is one person says that um, online job forums. So that's sort of where my mind naturally went. But I'd love to hear from you guys, the panelists, about, you know, where have you found um, the collaborators you've worked with? Amanda? Yeah, no, the majority of my collaborators come from being a conspicuous fan of their work. And mm -hmm. if you guys take anything away from the panel, from the things I say today, um, it should be that you need to contribute to a community before you try to extract value from it. It's important to understand and participate in a community and a space in order to understand what, what they value, what's going on there, why people are there, what they enjoy about it before you kind of burst in like the Kool-Aid man yelling, listen to my podcast. That is never successful and it's it's never positive. Uh, it's, it's not long-term growth. It's not, you know, investing in a space and becoming a valued member of a community. The, the stuff that actually motivates people to check out new work, to become a collaborator, to become a fan or an audience member of yours is when someone trusted to them tells them it's a good idea. And so a lot of our early collaborators are people whose podcasts I loved. And so we would tweet from our podcast accounts saying, did you check out this newest episode of this show? Oh my God, it's incredible. And we did it because we love it, because we knew our audience would enjoy it because they share some of our taste and then becoming friends and later collaborators with those creators. Uh, you know, fast forward six and seven years now, those are the people who have budgets and decisions and who are hiring and who I get to hire. It's about forming a long-term network of people who you help without any expectation of getting anything in return. Um, when you, you know, there's a big difference between saying to somebody, oh, hey, I want to rent your audience to promote my thing and saying, I love the work you're doing and we should totally work together in some way somehow in the future. Um, a lot of creator oriented advice is all about the short term. It's all about followers. It's all about, you know, boosting things now. And that is not the way to make sustainable long-term growth and connections. So well put, Jake. Big plus one to all of that. Like pretty much everyone that I collaborate at this point, it starts from a point of non-collaboration, uh, like an actual relationship where, where it's like, hey, I've been following you for a while and uh, I like everything you put out and I would love to just talk sometime. Uh, sometimes I'm so interested in meeting somebody and getting to like build a relationship that like I'll buy my way in. Sometimes they have like one-on-one -on -one consulting hours that they'll offer and I'll say, I'll just buy that. So I have the opportunity to talk to you for an hour and we'll see what can become of that. Uh, but it's, it's mostly, um, non-agendaed conversations that lead to more non-agendaed conversations that lead to like natural, oh, you're doing this thing. Yeah. Let me know. And I'll be happy to promote it or talk about it, or you can come on the show and do this type of thing. Um, those are also the most fulfilling, I find. <laughs> I guess I'll add on to, um, you know, what Amanda and Jay said, you know, I, I agree with everything um, clearly, but um, for us, we, it has been a very organic process. Um, I would say in journalism, it is literally about building your audience from one reader to the next. Um, and so it has been a long process coming and a lot of our you know a lot of our collaborations come from readers who have noticed our work um, or the hours that we put in and i think a lot of the organic growth begins you know has provided a very strong foundation for us you know we never um went into doing this expecting to get something out of the asian american uh, community or anything like that like what amanda has mentioned you go in there with the expectation of nothing in return um, and after a while you get you know people who are interested in your work. So and and through that you have to really assess what are the proper opportunities and ways you can grow. And so we've gotten a lot of organic growth through just you know word of mouth, um, through the people that we know personally. Um, we've definitely reached out to people on LinkedIn, a lot of social networks. Um, Twitter, I think, is a big one. I don't personally run a Twitter account, but I know that has been a good boon for us. And. Uh, a lot of the networks that we've been invited to, I think, over the years, and this has been a process, um, are now only starting to really getting us into the process of, you know, join, you know building up that community um, and to join in their opportunities. Um, for example, our fiscal sponsor, who we uh, took on last year, 
uh, Asian American Journalists Association is because of that relationship that we built with them in the community that now we are going to conferences and conventions and meeting all of these other networks of people. And so I would say it's definitely like, you know, moss growing on a rolling stone, you have to, it builds up over time, it's very cumulative, and it's gratifying to see once you get there, but the initial investment can be long and uh, might not be as quick as you might think, but it is definitely worth it, I think. Yeah, I love that all of you are sort of echoing the importance of thinking long term and approaching collaboration as a partnership over time, not necessarily just like, you know, what can I get out of this? How many users can I add? How many readers can I add? That kind of thing. Um, so I want to move into audience questions. Um, I, I had one question I didn't get to, which you guys are welcome to weave in, which is just sort of what are the warning signs that a collaboration is a bad idea? I think we've talked about that a little bit, but um, the first question is just, what goes into deciding who the potential collaborator could be? Is there a framework that you follow in terms of um, your collaboration workflow or your distribution of work? Amanda? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Um, I think that starting from a place of uh, letting everybody do the thing that they are best at and distributing that work you know, concurrently means that when you're looking for a new collaborator, ideally you want to kind of look for like a Venn diagram of skills or interests. You want to have something in common, but not 100% of things in common. Collaborating with somebody who's just like me uh, is not ideal or collaborating with somebody who my whole audience already knows and loves doesn't necessarily bring me or them anything in return. And so when I'm looking for somebody, I'm looking for someone who is enthusiastic, who wants to make the idea work for whatever reason, um, but who also can do things that I can't do on my own, um, or whose audience would be interested in the thing that I'm doing. So for example, when we look for creators to collaborate with, um, or to have on my mythology and folklore podcast, they don't have to be somebody who's really into mythology and folklore, but they can be somebody who shares our perspective. Um, it can be someone who is into the same subject matter, but from a totally different point of view or tone or format. Um, you want to, especially when it's a sort of cross promotion, you're giving kind of exposure to each other's audiences, you want everyone to walk away being a new fan of the other person in the collaboration. Uh, that is really what we're looking for ideally, is something in common, but not 100% of things in common. I love that. Jay, do you wanna add anything? I have almost nothing to add. <laughs> That's perfectly well articulated. Like you want a win-win and you want it to be uh, a group of people that you feel like is a good fit. You know, I I, uh, I really enjoy reality TV these days and uh, series on Netflix. And uh, I'll watch like uh, the new one I was watching is the um, Easy Bake Challenge with Anthony. And what you'll see on these shows is they always have guest judges. And the guest judges are hosts of other shows that likely the viewer of this will want to watch. And they're very like uh, passive in talking about that show. They don't even usually show like B-roll of that show. But she's like, we want to like very casually introduce you to somebody uh, who has a show that's also on this network that you may like. And by interacting with that person and seeing how they interact on this show, that might interest you in learning more. And that's kind of the, the vibe that I go for. And it needs to be a win-win. Um, uh, even if there is like some level of uh, theoretical competition where like, eh, we have similar products or services or whatever, like most of the time it doesn't matter. Like the, the world is wide enough, you know? So as long as it seems like both parties are going to come out uh, happier than they were beforehand, I think it makes a lot of sense. Totally. Like think, think of yourselves, like Andrew, I bet you read dozens of other, uh, you know, news sources and blogs and editorial, you know, talking about the same issues that you talk about, Jay, I'm sure you, you know, consume tons of content about the creator economy and being professional creators. I know that when I love something, I listen to like six different podcasts about the survivor TV show, analyzing survivor and talking about given episodes. I listen to like 10 times more podcast content than there are hours of survivor out per year. Um, and it's because when you're a fan of something, you want more of it. This is not sort of the early like or late 90s, you know, uh, fight between Good Morning America and the Today Show. It's not like people are putting on one thing on their drive time to work or one thing to get their weather in the morning. When we love something, we make room for it in our lives. And that's one of the great benefits of the digital economy. Um, your, your other people in your space are your colleagues and not your competitors. And it really behooves you to view them as such. Yeah, and I would just, um, I think that's beautifully articulated. Um, I, I think 
as a corollary to that, um, you know, going and trying to figure out mutual benefit, um, it's that oftentimes in these collaborations, you know, I think a good way to know is, you know, you come out of feeling very grateful that, you know, that gratitude to not only to, to you know, your partner, um, as well as to the people that you work with or community around you. And that this is really an opportunity to contribute. Um, you know, Adiyapi is a nonprofit for a reason. We're not here to make money. Um, or at least too many, too much of it, I suppose. Um, but it's here to because we want to contribute something. We recognize that our colleagues and partners are uh, working towards that same mission. It's not about competition. It's about how do we really work towards a single cause. And once you've checked off all of that, I think you come out of feeling that once you've gotten something out there, it feels good to have it out there and that you feel grateful that for all the people involved and in getting the sound. I also want to add... Um coming from a former freelancer who also works with a lot of people who do some freelancing, if you've ever had the experience of like a gut feeling that this isn't going to be a good fit, it that gut feeling is almost never wrong. And like, sometimes it may not even be as severe as it should be. But like, if you have a gut feeling in the early stages, I don't think this is going to work out. Odds are it's not going to work out. Uh, and even if you just, you know, played the odds and said, if I ever get that feeling, even though it might be wrong a quarter of the time, um, making it a rule to follow your gut on that is probably going to save you some heartache at the end. Yeah, collaborations generally don't improve with time. If the uh, if the experience of like negotiating a contract or getting something done or setting parameters is like pulling teeth, it's probably not going to like really fall into a great groove once it gets started. Um, and there are multiple times where we have turned down collaborations because it didn't seem like somebody else's top priority or because, you know, there are things and bumps and differences in the process um, that, you know, that made it clear. Uh, there was a, a vendor whose contract involves the a sort of clause that we could not work with anybody in a union. And that just doesn't jive with the values that multitude holds. And even though it was a lot of money that would have been very helpful in the short term, we know that defending that decision to our audience is not something that I felt I was in a position to do. So we made the choice to turn it down. And every time I have turned down a collaboration or ended a partnership, my only regret is that it hasn't been earlier. So especially early in your career, it can really feel so scarce. And like anybody wanting to work with you is like an opportunity you can't possibly turn down. But I really encourage you to view your audience's trust and also your enthusiasm as a creator and as the person driving this as really precious resources that you have to guard above all else. If I could uh, add one more thing on top of that um, is, you know, bandwidth. I think that's come something that gets overlooked. We are caught up in the enthusiasm of trying to get a partnership to work, but sometimes you just don't have the resources for it. And this is something that we've learned because we've had partnerships um, that were more short term, but, you know, still took up a great deal of our effort and time that was a little bit disproportionate. But, you know, as we move forward and we think, you know, do we really have the time and bandwidth? And so, we are in conversation with some media companies, but apparently recently we did not have the resources or the bandwidth. And this is why we turned down a few of those opportunities. And that's a perfectly okay reason to have. Um, and those reason, and those opportunities will still be there, I think, eventually in one form or another. And so there's no reason to rush into one now when it's not too convenient. Yeah. We have a series of questions that are sort of the nuts and bolts of collaboration. So I'll just say them all together and you guys can answer them as a collective. Um, so the first one is just about whether there are resources that are searchable to help you find creators that have the same values that you uh, want, you know, um, and then uh, like a searchable directory based on audience interests or types, kind of, I guess, maybe where does that research take you when you do it? Um, does it help with setting up an MOU, which I think, Amanda, you said yes, yes, yes. And um, how do you manage task management, communication, and transparency once you have that collaboration? So let's just tackle those as a group. Um, Jay, do you want to start? Well, I won't speak on the MOU part because I had to Google what that meant. Uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, anything that's going to help you align expectations is good. And if people are making explicit promises, then I think it's good to put into a contract to have some accountability for sure. Um, and to, I'll answer the question of like, is there a searchable database for this? Similar to what Amanda said earlier, I like I like this phrase of being a conspicuous fan because generally I, I think like there's probably somebody at least loosely in your sphere that you're already aware of that you would like to collaborate with and having some familiarity with that person 
is a really good starting point. It's really hard to go in cold and just like search for this person and 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 try to start from there because you're going to have to build some level of relationship first. And it's a lot easier to build a relationship when you've already spent some time being a conspicuous fan of this person. So I would I would uh, think about your own spheres and circles and whose posts are you stopping and reading on Instagram and you know who are you engaging with and if you really don't feel like you have that ask your fans and your audience and your sphere like who are you paying attention to because then it's a really nice in to go to that person and say hey people in my audience just keep bringing up your name and I would love to meet with you and see if there's something we can do together because it seems like there's a lot of crossover yeah, I would, I would definitely echo that and say that anything marketing itself as an all-in-one solution is probably just trying to make money off of you. And the way that real and lasting collaboration is found is by definition effortful. Um, and, and things that want to save you time and seem effortless um, are probably not where the real long-term connections are. So listen, you can make this easy on yourself. Like if you're in a space, if you're doing a project, you probably already consume a lot of, you know, creation and news and information in that space anyway. So just do your thing on the internet and exactly like Jay's saying, like pay attention to what sparks your attention. Pay attention to the people you enjoy, to the people who your community seem to respect and check out for yourself if that makes sense. Um, even though I also had to, uh, to look at what an MOU is, um, I do have my version of that, which is like an outline of important questions to ask collaborators before you get started, which I am dropping in the chat now. Um, and so even if what you write down is, you know, hey, this is my goal, this is what will make not fun for me, this is what I never wanna do, and this is what I'm into doing, um, having all that information just written out somewhere in a Google Doc, in an email, whatever you need, um, and a whiteboard, take a photo of the whiteboard uh, will make things a lot easier on you. I, I don't think I have much to add. Um, I personally have not used any resources to, um, to go and search for collaborators myself. Um, I think some of that time could be better spent, you know, like what Amanda and Jay have said, looking into what your interests are, and if not, building out your own content and making sure that it's the highest quality and that it can attract people uh to you as well and that's a different kind of um different kind of uh you know work in terms of that aspect but you know that's all i have yeah yeah i think that's a, that's a great point is that it can kind of work both ways um and then definitely check out the case study um if you're looking for more resources because that has uh more places that you can kind of look for opportunities to collaborate um thank you joanne ditas for dropping some links in the chat too about um places where you can find collaborate, collaboration opportunities. And then the last question comes from Joe. I think it's an interesting one. Um, do you find that it's better to start by figuring out what each partner sees as the best possible outcomes, like things that would indicate success, or the worst possible outcomes, things that would be deal breakers? I think it's like a glass half empty, glass half full question. So um, Andrew, do you want to take that one? Um, I, I don't think we have a particular... I think approach necessarily, nothing set in stone. Um, for us, when we were working with a collaborator, we have some big picture you know, values and visions. Um, and then we have a few options and we discuss with uh, our partners. And I personally always approach it with, you know, um, how can we make this work? You know, what is our flexibility on this? You know, open, you know, approaching things with an open mind, but clearly when it doesn't work, it doesn't work. There's no really doomsday scenario for us. I really hope I never have to encounter that kind of scenario in terms of our work. Um, and, you know, I, I've never really thought necessarily there's a best case scenario either, because I, I think whatever we can get out there and, you know, we will have tried our best, we will have explored every option. And, and you know, what we ever do, we do get out there is kind of um, what we can uh, is aligned with our values and aligned with the bigger vision that we have. And so I, I think that's generally how we approach it at the AFI. Jay? I usually start from a place that's more like, what will make this worthwhile? It's kind of like, what's the minimum viable outcome that's going to make this prove to be a success? Um, it's very hard for me to see. Like, I haven't even really experienced as Andrew was saying, like a doomsday situation with a with a collaboration where it was negative other than like maybe being a bad experience working together. And then it was just like, oh, I'm just not going to do that again. But what I what I typically try to do is just start small. You know, what's this what's it's a small version of this collaboration to just see if this works well together instead of, you know, planning some like 
six month commitment or something like what is one small thing we can do together to see how the audience responds or how this process goes and uh you know then we can have an open communication to make it better totally this is still a you know a group you want to motivate this is still a uh, a partnership that you want to start on the right foot so i think beginning with you know setting a goal collaboratively talking about why we like each other and why we want to work together and then saying like you'll notice that i frame the negative as what would make this not fun anymore or what would make this not worthwhile anymore to guard our enthusiasm and our excitement and the relationship by saying you know, how would we know in our body, in our minds, in our schedules that this is not a thing we love anymore? And so saying things like, mm, I'm more stressed about it than I am excited, or mm, I dread doing this, you know, those are all signs that we need to, uh, you know, we need to kind of recalibrate to make something work. So I think it's important to start with uh, how things could go well, and then also just to name to make less scary, the ways in which this could be uh, not positive for everybody anymore. Because at the end of the day, you know, we are not getting rich being creators, we are making stuff that has an impact in the world. The people getting rich are usually not the ones that share our values, um, speaking for myself personally. So we're, again, we're in this for a long time and a good time. And that is how you should approach collaboration. Thank you, Amanda, for putting such a nice little bow on the conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, Amanda, Jay, and Andrew, thank you so much for such a dynamic and inspiring talk, for being so open and willing to share. Um, and uh, we're going to move now to our final session. There's a link in the chat to that. It's a chance to talk to um, all the moderators today. And we're going to be video on just having a little bit of a debrief about what we learned. Thank you again to our panelists and I uh, hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.